Hello everybody and welcome to the second meeting of the beer evaluation course. This time we will do a brewing process overview to make sure everyone are on the same page about how beer is made. Just wanted to remind you that if you like the video, please hit that like button and if you have any questions, please comment on the video and I will answer. If you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, please hit the subscribe button and click the bell icon to get notified when my next videos come out. In addition, if you haven't followed me on my social media, you can see them changing on the screen right now or find them in the description below. And now, without further ado, let's get to our presentation of the day about an overview of the brewing process. This is the second presentation of the beer evaluation course with an overview of the brewing process. This is the layout of today's presentation. We are going to talk about all the different steps in the brewing process with their inputs, outputs, objectives, and needed equipment. The first step we will talk about is the milling of the malt. The objective of milling is to break the endosperm, which is the starchy white part of the malt, into smaller pieces while keeping the husks as intact as possible. This will make the starch more soluble in the mash while avoiding the extraction of off flavors, mainly tannins, from the malt into the beer. The process description is, the grains are weighed to the required amounts and brought to the mill. This can be done manually by grain bags or automatically by conveyors. Afterwards, the grains are milled and broken into smaller pieces. Then the milled grains are transferred into the grist case, which is located above the mash tun. The needed equipment is a place to store the grains, so either silos or grain bag storage room, conveyors or hands to move the grist into the grist case, and of course, a grist case. The next step in the brewing process is the mash. Here, the objective is to convert the malt starches into simpler sugars that the yeast can metabolize into alcohol. In general, the milled grist is mixed with hot water at specific temperatures and allowed to rest for specific durations. We will not talk today about the temperatures and durations. We will talk about that in the fourth presentation. The mash is done in a mash tun. A mash tun is a large vessel that has enough space to hold the grist and water. In systems that allow for step mash, the mash tun will have a mixer and some form of heating. Breweries that do a decoction mash will have another vessel to heat the grains that need cereal mash. The mash tun can be the same vessel as the lautering tun, but in general breweries they will be separated to avoid bottlenecks and increase production. At the end of the mash process, we have a very, very sweet barley soup. The next step is to separate the sweet liquid from the grains. This is called lautering, after the German word. The objective of the lauter step is to separate the wort, which is the sweet liquid, from the grains. The process works by moving the mash to the lauter tun. The lauter tun is a vessel with a perforated false bottom that allows us to drain the liquid while keeping the grains behind. To remove the wort, the brewer will initiate the wort runoff to the kettle. At first, the wort comes out very turbid from grain particles and proteins. To reduce this phenomena, the wort will be pumped back to the lauter tun above the grains. This process of recirculation is also known by its German name, Horlov. Once the wort is coming out clear into the kettle, the brewer will stop the pump and start collecting wort in the kettle. When the height of the water reaches or gets close to the height of the grain bed, the brewer will start sprinkling warm water on the top of the grains to remove as much sugars as possible. The process of adding warm water to the grains is called sparge. The equipment needed for the process is first a lauter tun. A lauter tun is a vessel that can hold the mesh and has a false bottom for filtering the grains from the wort. 
The vessel also has sprinklers for the sparge process. And in very large vessels, there will usually be a rake that rotates slowly to make sure the grain bed does not become too compact and not allow liquid to pass through. After we have our wort, the next step is to boil it. The objectives of the boil are sixfold. These are to develop color and flavor through mired effects, to evaporate excess water to reach the desired volume, sterilize the wort by killing bacteria and foreign wild yeast, to extract hop oils for flavor and aroma, and to coagulate excess proteins. Note that the first three happen simply from the boil, but the last three require kettle additions. The process goes as follows. The wort is boiled for 90 minutes in total. During the boil, the brewer adds hops at certain times. We will talk about the different times a brewer can add hops in the fifth presentation about the hops and the boil. In the last 15 minutes, the brewer also adds a coagulant to remove proteins. During the boil, alpha acids from the hops isomerize into their more water-soluble and more bitter form. The wort also becomes darker from mired effects and caramelization of the sugars. The equipment needed for the boil is a boil kettle that can be heated by either steam, direct fire, or direct heating elements. Note that direct fire kettles will add more caramelization to the wort, darkening the wort and creating caramel flavors. After the boil is finished, the wort is moved to the whirlpool. The objective of the whirlpool stage is to separate the wort from proteins and hop debris before fermentation. These materials can develop into off flavor during fermentation. During this process, the brewer transfers the wort into the whirlpool. The whirlpool is a conical vessel with a tangential entry port which directs the wort along the inside of the tank, causing it to spin. When the tank is full, the wort is allowed to stop spinning and rest for about 15 minutes. This will concentrate the debris in the middle. Next, the wort is pumped out via an opening in the side of the conical bottom to remove the wort without the debris. For this process, we need a whirlpool. The whirlpool is a large vessel with a conical bottom and a tangential entry port that allows to spin the wort. The vessel should have two outputs, one in the bottom of the conical bottom for dumping hops and proteins and for cleaning, and another one at the side of the conical bottom, higher than the debris to remove the clear wort. From the whirlpool, the wort is transferred into the chiller to cool from the near boil temperatures to fermentation temperatures. The objective of the chilling process is to get the wort down to yeast pitching temperatures as fast as possible. The objective can be achieved by two main ways. The first is using a chiller, also called a heat exchanger. In this method, the wort is moved from the whirlpool through the chiller. Hot wort flows in one direction, and cool water or coolant flow in the other direction through a series of plates or through tubing. The water or coolant absorbs the energy from the wort and thus cooling it. The second method is to use a cool ship. In this method, the wort is transferred from the whirlpool into a wide, shallow pool and left to cool for the night. The large surface area of the wort increases the cooling rate of the liquid through evaporation. Since the wort is left exposed to air for a long time, the wort becomes enucleated with ambient yeast and bacteria. The equipment needed for this process is a heat exchanger or a cool ship. After the wort has been cooled, it is moved into the fermenter for fermentation. The next step before fermentation is aeration and pitching. The objectives here are to add oxygen for the first stage of the fermentation and add yeast into the fermenter. The process starts when the beer is cool and in the fermenter. Oxygen or filtered air is pumped into the wort through a carbonation stone. Next, yeast are added in either liquid or dry form. To perform this, the brewer needs an oxygen tank or an air pump and filters, and a carbonation stone. 
after pitching, fermentation starts. The objective of fermentation is to convert the sugar into ethanol and CO2 without creating off flavors. As we discussed, for fermentation to begin, yeast are added to the oxygenated wort. The yeast will mainly convert the sugar in the wort into ethanol and CO2 along with other compounds at lower rates. Beer fermentation is generally done by Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which are ale yeast, or by Saccharomyces pastorianus that are responsible for lager fermentation. The equipment needed for fermentation are fermenters. Since yeast are sensitive to the geometry and depth of the vessel, different versions exist. But modern breweries will normally use inert stainless steel cylindro-conical vessels. But fermentation can also be done in open cool ships, wooden vats, or wooden barrels. Each will have different effects on the beer. After fermentation, the beer goes to the maturing stage. Lagering in German means to cellar. Here, the objective is to store the beer in cold temperatures to make it smoother and reduce the levels of sulfur, tannins, and proteins in the beer. The beer is removed from the yeast by transferring it to another tank or by dumping the yeast from the bottom of the fermenter. The beer is then stored between minus one to five degrees Celsius while the remaining yeast clean the beer. In the past, this stage took 10 to 20 weeks depending on the beer strength. But today, due to beer research, it usually takes two to four weeks. The equipment needed is a cylindro-conical fermenter that has a yeast dump option or a lagering tank in case the beer is moved. After the maturation period, the beer is filtered. The objective of filtration is to remove yeast, proteins, and other haze-causing particles from the beer, to make the beer more appealing and to make it more shelf-stable. The process can be done in several ways, from racking, and fining agents to actual filtering of the beer. The equipment needed is filters, fining agents, and or bright tanks. After the beer is filtered, now comes the time for carbonating the beer. The objective of the carbonation step is to inject CO2 into the beer. The process can be done in several ways. The brewer can close the fermentation tank near the end of fermentation to retain CO2, to add CO2 in line during transfers, to add CO2 to the tank, or to add yeast and sugar to the package for second fermentation. The equipment needed is pressure holding fermentation tanks or bright tanks and sugar and yeast or CO2 tanks. After carbonation, the beer is ready for packaging. The objective of packaging is to move the beer to the serving vessel while keeping it from contamination, oxidation, and losing its carbonation. The process starts with cleaning and sanitizing the packaging vessel. Next, the beer is transferred pressurized into the vessel, and lastly, the vessel is sealed. The equipment needed is packaging vessels, such as kegs, bottles, etc., and packaging lines for either bottles or draft. After the beer is packaged, the next and final step is to distribute it to retailers and then to consumers. This is where we're finishing the second presentation of the beer course about a brewing process overview. I hope that the talk, while being shorter than usual, was informative and interesting. I want to remind you that if you liked the video, please hit that subscribe button, like button, and the bell icon to get notified when my next videos come out. If you have questions, please write them in the comments and I will answer. In addition, you can see my social media handles change on the screen or find them in the description of this video. You're welcome to follow me to know when my next projects come out. Thank you for listening. I was Omar Basha and see you in the next meeting where we will discuss grains and malt.